wearing the navy blue of Victoria. Yes, he uses his feet and goes again through midwicket. That's an even better shot from the Victorian captain. Swept away very nicely by the Cole Bottom for four. Oh, he's re-given! That is 50. The man from Northcote. Welcome to the latest edition of the Vic State Cricket Podcast. This is going to be a very special episode because we are talking to uh, someone that not only played cricket for Victoria, but also won a Brownlow medal. And there is only one person in the history of the world that's done that, and that is Peter Bedford who joins us. Peter, it is a great privilege to have you part of our podcast today. Oh, pleasure to be with you, Adam, today. It's a pretty special thing, and I know you get asked about it a lot, but to win a Brownlow medal... And to essentially win a Sheffield Shield in the same year. Yeah. So it wasn't just that you're a participant, you're a, a Sheffield Shield winning player and a Brownlow medalist in the same season, same oh, year. Adam, it was a, uh, when I look back on it, it was an uh, unbelievable calendar, calendar year. I was fortunate enough to be part of the 66 7 uh, Sheffield Shield, but uh, I only played one game that year. I was 12th man, I think about six times under Jack Potter, who kept, who was the, uh, our captain, of course. And uh, then 60, uh, 69, 70, Bobby Cowper was captain. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was, my career was sort of starting to blossom, blossom a bit. And, uh, yeah, we uh, were top, top of the table. And in those days you didn't play a final per se. It was just the points tally at the end which saw you the winner of the, of the Sheffield Shield. And I mean, Bill Jacobs was manager of our... Uh, the team that went on the Western Tour, our last two matches of the season, and we were we were on top of the table. Normally we go West Australia, South Australia, but this time we were South Australia, West Australia. And uh, anyhow, I used to room with Johnny Scholes, legendary, yep. you know, district premier player, of course, as we know. And uh, uh, Blair Campbell was our, our predominant spinner, you know, left arm uh, over the wrist. Yep. I was going to say something yep, else. With no, Biden, that's right. you know the <laughs> yep. You know the terminology. Yes. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so uh, anyhow, Blair, Blair had a bit of a history of knee problems and that, and he's coming, he's bowling to Greg, Greg Chapel, and uh, uh, yeah, he, Greg was sort of handling him okay, and, uh, but unfortunately uh, Blair had a bit of a knee a knee problem, so he had to go, go off. And uh, I thought, oh, gee, because we... We struck about four days of century temperature and, of course, you know, in those days it was, there was a little bit of socialising and uh, to replace the lost fluids of the day, a few of us would head down to Largs Bay <laughs> and not to any late hour but just to replenish the lost fluids <laughs> of, of a warm, warm summer's day. So Skulls, you know, I think, oh, we're going to have a quiet day in the field and when Blair broke down I looked around and I thought, who else in the team here will bowl? Will bowl slow, spinners. And so... Bobby Capper threw me the ball and fortuitously I bowled 14 overs and got five for 40, which were my best figures, uh, Adam, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get uh, Greg Chappell for the second time in my in my career. So when we look back on footy and cricket, uh, I can honestly say that some of my memories of cricket are far more sustainable to me than football, even though I won the Brownlow medal. So... And that win, we won that match and, uh, of course, went to Perth with an unassailable lead and, uh, yeah, we, we, we trained a little bit casually over there and uh, celebrated <laughs> the, the victory in that. So it was, <laughs> it was a great season. And, of course, South uh, making the finals, uh, the Swans, uh, in the first time since '45, the bloodbath at, at mm. uh, Princess Park and under, under Norm Smith and, uh, yeah, and myself having, yeah, the, good fortune of winning the Brownlow and uh, beating the likes of G Gary Dempsey, Alex Jezelenko and Barry Cable. So and when I look back, that was a, no, it was a great calendar year, uh, Adam, all round. It's no doubt <laughs> about that. We'll probably revisit that as we, we have yeah. a chat. But when we're here at, uh, at the Junction Oval, the City Power Centre, when you come here, now you've played footy on this ground, you've played cricket on this ground, do you remember it as a more a cricket ground or a football ground, considering what you did over your sporting career? Uh, predominantly more more footy. I played uh, – actually, I coached Carlton for a, in the cricket for a season in 73, 74. We played St Kilda in and actually I, I was lucky enough to get uh, the phantom out. Uh, right. Caught, caught backward square leg. He just tried to sweep one and got a bit of a toppage and uh, Rod, Rod Hines, who was the opening bowler with Carlton, took, took the catch. But – 
in 65, 67, I was playing with Port Melbourne in the VFA the old days and uh, we used to play the grand finals here. Uh, well, that particular year, 65, we played at Port, got beaten by Waverley. Then we played Waverley down here in 66. And I guarantee there are probably about 30,000 people here, Adam, you know, and because uh, you didn't have the seating. It was just people would, would sprawl up to the terrace sort of thing yep. area behind the goals and around the side. And, uh, yeah, we got beaten in 65 at Port, actually, and then uh, we redeemed ourselves here in 66, uh, beating Waverley again by about six or seven goals. And then there was a match, I don't know whether you've you, you read or heard about it, we played uh, Dandenong at, uh, at Punt Road in 67. And uh, oh, it was an absolute crucifixion. Uh, <laughs> I suppose you shouldn't be critical of umpires, but... Uh, in racing parlance, uh, I don't know you enjoy our little <laughs> wages. In a Melbourne Cup field, it's like a horse racing three wide for the entire journey, one getting a <laughs> nice suck along the fence. And John Peck was our full forward. And virtually every time Pecky went near the ball, the umpire blew the whistle and paid a free kick against him. And in 66, I went to the carnival in Hobart with a VFA. It was a five team carnival VFA, VFL, South Australia, West Australia, and Tassie. And the best umpire in the, in the VFA was a fellow called Alan O'Neill and he was a designated VFA umpire. And he umpired our second semi-final, which we won by about six or seven goals against Dandy Nong. And for some unknown reason, he, Dandy, won the preliminary final and we played them again in the, Dan, in the grand final. For some unknown reason, he was the actual emergency umpire. And a fellow called David Jackson umpired the match and, uh, well... I probably don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's but still people raw. people who were there would recall it well, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyhow. So uh, obviously a Brownlow medalist, you sort of feel like we should talk about football because not only a Brownlow medalist but a five-time best and fairest winner at the Swans, team of the century, AFL Hall of Fame member. It, it is quite remarkable. But it's your love of cricket that still kind of stands the test of time. Is that is that fair to say? Oh, unquestionably so, uh, Adam. I, uh, as a youngster, I uh, I played first played, I guess, as a maybe ten or eleven year old with Garden City, the Paris Centre Port Melbourne, uh, <laughs> where Port Colts play yep. on the the oval on Williamstown Road and uh, Graham Street. There, as a concrete wicket, then we played from nine to twelve. Then, uh, as I got a little bit older, I. I'd wander down to the port ground and there'd be two cars to go the away game and play between one and six on the turf. And then uh, on Sunday, I'd play just across where, from where I live now in the Graham Hotel in Port Melbourne, the Lagoon Oval, as it is. And you carry out the mats out, you know, peg the mats in. So I'd concrete Saturday morning, turf Saturday afternoon and matting Sunday afternoon. If I could have played another game, I would have had them, you know, so... <laughs> So that that was uh, that was my that was my my passion. Uh, so passion where did that love come from? Oh, I think it was really reinforced. It was just one of those things. As a, uh, yeah, cricket just became a really passion. I enjoyed the footy, but I wasn't all that right into it. Even though I used to go over to South Melbourne in the old days because Bobby Skilton, my idol as a kid, grew up in Port, you know, in Griffin Crescent off Williamstown Road, and uh, I'd go over there with a number fourteen on my back and stand behind the goals, but. It was cricket and it was reinforced, I think, in 60, 61 when the West Indies came. I was 13, you know, well, I'm seven, coming up 77 in April anyhow. So. <laughs> but uh, it was reinforced, I was about a 13-year-old, that 60, 61 series when uh, Frank Worrell and uh, Sir Frank Worrell now, oh, as he passed away, of course, he came from Sir Frank, and Richie Benno played that fantastic series, you know, and... Uh, I think, as you, you may recall, I remember history, uh, Adam, the, um, the white Australia policy was in vogue through that, the 50s and that it was just sort of, it was sort of a little lingering a little bit, I guess, and it was, it was viewed with a little bit of apprehension, I think, the tour, that particular tour. But Richie and Frank Worrell, they just made it such a great series. And, of course, the first test up at the, up at the Gabba, the tied test match, yeah. you know, and, uh, and I remember Richie bowling to uh, Garfield Sobers, you know, and he bowled him a half volley just outside off and he punched it back straight down the ground for boundary. And I thought as much as the game was played in a really hard spirit, there was also that uh, sense of uh, 
friendliness between us. Well, Richie, after when he played the shot, he turned around and applauded the shot. You know, I thought, geez, you know, that's that's real sportsmanship. You know? yeah. And then, of course, uh, the match at the uh, Adelaide over the fourth test, when uh, oh, Australia were on the ropes, we were, we were nine down, and Lindsay Klein, our last man in, to bat with Slash and Mackay, Ken Mackay, and. <sighs> Legend had it that Lindsay was out in the practice nets at the back of their load over and got knocked over a dozen times or something. So, and he got in, I think, just before tea, but hung on to tea. And he and uh, Slasher and Lindsay thwarted the might of the West Indies for that entire last session. And if you may recall, you probably know this the last ball of the day, uh, Slasher obviously and Lindsay, they'd worked so hard. He wasn't going to lay bat on it. He turned his body and he took the ball on the chest. He took the ball on the chest and I thought, geez, you know, how, how good is that? And then, you know, the final test and then there ended up being a ticket to welcome, uh, farewell actually at the uh, Melbourne Town Hall and, oh, there were tens of thousands of people there, you know, so they really they really embraced the uh, that test series. So that, that in a sense sort yeah. of really reinforced my love of the... Love of the game, that particular. But I, and as a teenager, I would get into the, uh, go and watch all the Shield matches because in those days you'd probably have about four Shield matches, you know, and their the Boxing Day match was, of course, uh, the Vicks in New South yep. Wales. And uh, I remember uh, sitting in the stand, I'd be behind the wicket there, you know, and uh, and I remember when they had the umbrella field and big Gordon Rourke, you know, and the drag reel was in and, you know, and Richie had the umbrella field, had about four slips and two gullies and virtually had one player forward of the wicket, you know. And there was Gordon Rock, I reckon, the first over of this, uh, the Vicks are batting. He's coming, I reckon the ball pitched on about middle and there was poor uh, Doug Ford, the wicket keeper, diving aimlessly to his left. I reckon there were 12, 12 wides <laughs> in the first <laughs> over, three lots of four wides. <laughs> but those memories and that. And can, can I keep going? Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. And... Uh, I remember Keith Kirby, who I later played with. Uh, Keith was a great leg spinner at Essendon, of course, and uh, I um, it was that Boxing Day match and New South Wales was star-studded, you know. They've had about six or seven uh, test players in the team. Well, nothing really changed. No, that's right. So, <laughs> so, and I remember Keith bowling from the Shane, well, Southern Stand in Shane Morning and uh, we had New South Wales about six or eighty. Bowling, and Rip, Rip had about three for 20. And Richie came in and joined Graham Thomas, who played for Australia, of course, too. And they devised a plan to try and knock Rip out of the attack. So they kept hitting him into the outfield, you know, over a long off and, you know. And Rip, uh, I was going to say begged, he, he asked Fando to afford him a bit of protection because bowling league spin, as we know, you can be a little bit full, a little bit yeah. short, you know, instead of bowling that stuff, you should almost be right on. And Fando just said, no, we'll persist with this, the same field and sort of thing. And at the end of the day, New South Wales were six, six, four, six for 300, <laughs> uh, Benno 100, Thomas 100. So they both got, <laughs> both got century. So fast forward, a match at the G and uh, uh, the Vicks played South Australia. And Les Favre was captain of South Australia. And uh, first day of the match, uh, Les won the toss and batted. And... Uh, about half an hour before lunch, Fando threw me the ball. And I, I've got all these memories flooding through my head about Rip, you know, four or five whatever years earlier. <laughs> he got smashed all over the place, you know. And I, I reckon in the context of Keith's career, it was pivotal because I think if he'd have gone on and got maybe a five or six, for he could have easily played for Australia. But anyhow, so Fando throws in the ball, so I was a little bit, oh, you know, apprehensive. <laughs> but... <laughs> but Fortuitously, uh, I ended up bowling 23 overs on the first over shield match at the MCG, eight ball overs. I bowled the whole session between lunch and tea from the members' end and got four for 78 and uh, picked up the two chapels. Not Trevor, Ian and Greg. So, <laughs> so I caught and bowled Greg and I had Ian caught Ian Redbath bowl me. I, I bowled Johnny Corsby, 97, and then I... He opened the batting and then I uh, had Eric Freeman, Fritzy Freeman, uh, caught by a slug behind. So they were my four victims in that particular match. So I waved a, you know, heaved a sigh of relief uh, at the end of that day, uh, Adam. So <laughs> how, how, I mean, the, some of the biggest names in Australian cricket you're talking about here, yeah. how vivid are the memories? That sound like they're still pretty vivid that you remember oh, them. Yeah, and 
you know, to anybody as a, as a kid, I guess you dream of making a hundred on the MCG. Well, uh, I had the good fortune to do that. I uh, batting with Graham Watson, my teammate at Melbourne and and Victoria, and of course, what I played with Australian. And uh, he scored 150 and I got 134 not out. And it was against Western Australia. And uh, one of the, the bowlers in the West Australian team happened to be a fellow called Lily. So, so, so when, I, when I think back, I think, you know, that's when you're perhaps a little bit flat at times and you think back, geez, you know, I guess for a person who loved their cricket, I think anybody would take that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so again, comparing the footy with the cricket, to yeah. make 100 at the MCG yeah. for Victoria in a first-class game against Dennis Lilly, yeah. to bowl at the MCG and get both chapels out, yes. to that, is that more special to you than playing in a final series for South Melbourne, winning a Brownlow medal? Is that, or is it just impossible to compare the two well, because it's apples it, and oranges? It is a bit, but as I say, cricket was always my passion and, and I think probably the cricket memories were probably just slightly edge, edge out yeah. the, the footy memories, Adam, you know. Yeah. So, yeah and I, one, another time, probably as I got that 100 up there and uh, 134 not out and I think it's important the not out too. Oh yeah, one undefeated. other undefeated. Yeah, we, we put on two ninety, <laughs> and I, I think it was just last. Might have been last year for the fourth week, I think it was, and I think it might have been last season. Sammy Harper and was it uh, Peter Hanscom? Peter Hanscom broke, they broke, did. The, re- broke yep. the record or something. Yeah, I think. Don't anyway, that's that, a road out there. The yeah. MCG was <laughs> had grass on it. It was also it was really hard to bat that but, day. But funnily enough, I, I remember we we played a, ma- a match up at the, at the Gabba, and the Testies were out. You know, so. I used to bat four. I bat four when the testies uh, were away, and uh, they had Peter Allen, who good quickie and that you know. And the ball up there in those days, you change it to sixty five overs. Obviously, eight ball overs. Yep. You change it, and the ball would swing. You know, it's swinging right up to the time that it was it was changed. You know, quite quite a bit. So Peter Allen got about six in the first innings, and anyhow, um, so the second innings uh, we got Queensland out at about. It was five o'clock and up there it gets dark pretty early, mm-hmm. as you know, so we're finishing at five thirty. So so I've come in a little bit little bit perspiring, so I'm under the shower and, and Kenny Eastwood opened with Russell Sincock, you know, play with Richmond and of course Eastie played the tests in Sydney for Australia. Our first drop was Les Joslin and I was batting four. So I thought oh five o'clock, ten minute change over, twenty minutes to play. I thought, oh, you know, have a shower and just relax and uh, <laughs> anyhow in the shower, I just get out, dried myself, and and just put my creams on, and all of a sudden, stamping of the feet. We're one for none. <laughs> and yeah, next minute, more stamp. We're two for none. So I'm in. So I, I quickly put my gear on and wandered out. And I thought, why on earth are we out here? Oh, honest to God, those bulbs on the on the scoreboard they shone like beacons, you know. And I'm thinking they had their own umpire, so I don't think you could actually query the light at that stage. It was up to the umpires to, the, to determine it. And so we, we batted away. We worked our way through the stumps, two for seven. And the next day, uh, we're out there batting, 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 and, and we're nine down and I'm, I'm still in. And uh, I was joined by Froggy, Froggy Thompson. And uh, I'm 96. I'm 96. And... Uh, the only trouble was that I was at the non-strikers end and, and Frog was facing uh, John Morgan, Sandy Morgan, a bit of a feisty, blonde-headed quick with uh, Queensland, obviously. So <laughs> he's bouncing Frog and he hit him. He took a couple on the on the body and that, and I thought, oh, jeez, you know. So he survived the over. And uh, anyhow, next next day, Peter Allen's bowling from the, the outer end and... Uh, I made a premeditated decision. I thought, oh, 96 or so, I'll get the 100. I'll just sort of hit it, fully pitch delivery. I'll just hit through the line straight back down the ground for four, get the 100. Bad decision. <laughs> Knock me over. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another memory. So when I'm, to get 76 out of 178, you know, so it was another... Uh, Another good, uh, good little memory from our cricket. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So I want to go back to when you're playing three times a weekend. Yes. Now I believe you're only ten playing in the under fourteen. I was ten. I was and ten. And then all yeah. of a sudden you're playing senior cricket. Yep. As a ten year old, just sneaking in and playing in the thirds or fourths at Port Melbourne. I was, I was, and we used to play over at the Lagoon Oval. Actually, the fourth eleven would play in a pocket 
uh, off the on the main oval, but it was obviously very boundaries. Boundaries are pretty short, <laughs> you know. So yeah, so I was I was there. So, so what was that like? Because it, it then sort of set a bit of a trend for you that for quite a few years you're playing as a young teenager against yeah. men, yeah. Um, and that can be fairly intimidating at times. Uh, How did you go and, through that period? Yeah, well, even though I was not, it wasn't a big kid, obviously, and I'm, and but I never felt intimidated by men, Adam. You know, mm. I always thrived on the challenge, and I, I was fortunate enough to play my first senior match with Port. Uh, as a 14-year-old, I played... Friend In the Layla, first 11. First 11. First 11 match at 14. And uh, we played Preston at the Port Ground. And Fred Layla, who was a fantastic Carlton player, you know, district player or premier player of his now, and I think he played in about three or four grand finals with Carlton at, at the Albert and that, you know. But Fred was a leg spinner batsman and, uh, you know, was, well, instrumental in my, my development. And I remember I was playing a... Uh, I think I was 14... And playing a uh, a finals match out at uh, on the boulevard, uh, Ivanhoe, Ivanhoe, yeah. Ivanhoe at Ivanhoe, and Clive Fairburn, uh, who had the sports store in the city, you know, and uh, Hardware Lane, and Cole Guest came out and had a look at the match in it, you know, and uh, anyhow, so uh, they must have been suitably impressed, Ferry, because Mum at the time, I'm the youngest of five kids, and Mum decided. Or the others said virtually after six years between my brother and I. The next time. So mum decided she wanted to go and do a bit of work and, and just get out. So she got a job in Coles in the city where David Jones is now, you know, and uh, and she worked there for 13 or 14 years. And now Clive would come down, oh, Mrs Bedford, when's Peter coming to Melbourne? Oh, Clive, I think I'll go to South because I played three years of Dowling with South, Adam, you know, and played, played with Johnny McWhorter. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in those days, and I think the expectation was to go to South, but you know, my bowling, my bowling was pretty much. I probably consider myself more a bowler than a bat, but anyhow, but they both sort of coming coming on nicely, and uh, and South had three slowies, uh, Jeff Blake, uh, Ian Quick, and who was the who was the other one? Yeah, uh, just just trying to think now. Anyhow, they had a sort of plethora of slow bowlers and. That Melbourne had Lindsay, who was pretty much at the tail end of his career, and I. So, anyhow. Uh, so you did your research before you made your decision. I well, I just thought a bit about it, but, yeah. but the opportunity to play with Melbourne, you know, the Melbourne cricket and play at the, the Albert is just unbelievable, you know. And, and but South probably at that time, South was probably a more prestigious club than MCC with their record, you know, former. Oh, players who captained Australia, captained Australia, and that's mm. you know going back and uh, and players who'd represented Australia, you know, sort of it was uh, they were they were sort of you know probably clearly one of the one of the clubs which had uh, contributed greatly to Australian cricket as uh, players playing for Australia, and uh, so I went to Melbourne and uh, yeah you wouldn't believe play the first game I played it was a. Uh, was against South in the seniors. I was sixteen. I was sixteen when I played my first first uh, district match, a premier match, and uh, yeah, I, I think I just had a quiet quiet day. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was nice just to uh, to um, you know to play play your first game there. Yeah, and unfortunately it was against, against South, and then we we battled away a bit, battled away, and uh, of course I uh, my footy started to come on, and I was playing with Port in the VFA. And uh, obviously, still playing uh, cricket with, with cricket with Melbourne, and uh, in those days, he used to have footy carnivals, and uh, and it was a VFA, VFL, South Australia, Western Australia, and Tassie. In '66, I was 19, and uh, I got selected in the VFA team to go to Hobart for the carnival, and uh, so I was at Two Rack Teachers College in Glenfrew Road, Malvern, and uh, just doing a primary primary teachers course in the first year. And uh, so I requested two weeks' leave from the principal, Joe St. Allen, which was granted, then went to Hobart, had a great time, so they had four games in ten days and, and uh, came back and then did the teaching rounds, which I loved, and then in the October I got selected in the state cricket team. So confidently I marched into the office of the principal, Mr. St. Allen, uh, requesting a further two weeks' leave and... Uh, he could have knocked me over the feather at him. He said, what do you want to do, son, be a teacher or a sportsman? I thought, I, and as we've alluded to earlier, uh, 
cricket being my passion, there was no way known I was going to miss this opportunity to represent Victoria, <coughs> pardon me, uh, in the Sheffield Shield. So I, was, I said, I think I want to be a sportsman. This is <laughs> so He said, you better relinquish your position here, son. So, But just quickly fast-forwarding, um, uh, around 72, I sat beside uh, Lindsay Thompson at a function, you know, and I was playing footy with South, you know, we might go back and talk about how I got to South. <laughs> But um, and uh, sitting next to Lindsay Thompson, he said he used to speak with a bit of inflection in his voice. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you know, he said, "Peter, you used to be a student teacher, didn't you?" I said, "Yes, Mr. Thompson." He said, "You know they have adult education courses. Ever thought of doing one?" I said, "Oh, I did, but the thought passed me by because <laughs> things are going going all right." As I say, I was leave when he was going all right with South and still playing Shield Creek, and I was just working here. Nine to five job as we all did in those days, you know. So, but uh, yeah, so so that was that. But <laughs> uh, trying to leave port to go to south was a difficult situation from a footy point of from view. From a footy point yeah. of view, because uh, uh, even though even though geographically so close, uh, philosophically they were poles mm. apart. There was a lot of angst, and, and it, got, it went right back because and there's a bit of synergy because Dad was a very good fault. Dad's in Port's team of the century mm. and uh, Dad played cricket with Port, obviously, and could play golf off three, you know, so Dad was an excellent all-round sportsman. And he was courted by South in the 30s when they had the Foreign Legion, you know, under Johnny Leonard, who came from Western Australia, and, you know, Nashes and the Pratts and all those, you know. And uh, and Port wouldn't clear him at that time and that's so, uh, yeah, it was disappointing. And then... Uh, Robbie Freer, who I play with at Port, his his uh, his dad Ted, ended up leaving Port without a clearance and played with Essendon. And I think the sec his second season at Essendon, I think he kicked twelve goals in the first round uh, of his second year at, at Essendon. So it had been, you know, through the years where, as I say, there was that little bit of bit of angst mm. to them. But my first game, oh geez, South Bay footy, uh, nineteen sixty eight. I was twenty one in the April. And uh, we just got married, Brenda and I, and, and playing Sheffield Shield cricket in those days, Adam, uh, we used to get $7 a day, 28 bucks for four consecutive days. And I remember Paul Sheehan coming in. When you're in batting, you talk about anything and everything. I remember him coming in and he said, hey, Wheels, he said, you know what, the fellow working on the gate at the Melbourne Cricket Ground on a Sunday got more for the one day than we did for the four days putting, putting on the show. <laughs> so... so the advent of Kerry Packer was probably inevitable down the track and I reckon every every international cricketer now, you know, before they go to bed at night, I reckon they shouldn't be able to say, thank you, Mr Packer. But but anyhow, so so South Beats and Kilda the first round of 68 and uh, that opportunity to go there, and I got a lump sum, we got a lump sum pay, which I was to put a deposit on a house. So it was a bit of a no-brainer. Okay? And... Uh, so that first South Beast and Kilda, the first round of '68 at the um, at the Lake Oval, and uh, <laughs> hindsight's a wonderful thing. Who, who, in their right mind, would want to make their debut at Glenbury Oval, Adam? <laughs> so. Especially if it was wet. <laughs> wet, exactly, because it's like a glue pot, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, we decided to go to play. So. Alan Miller was coach, and Alan lived just down the road a couple of blocks in Garden City. And uh, we were staying with, uh, Brenda and I were staying with her parents in, in uh, Edwards Avenue there, and we bought the house just around the corner. And we just sort of finalised a few things out there. So I was getting a lift out with Alan to the ground, you know. But that preceding week, uh, Norm Goss and Jack McFarlane, everybody called him Darky, Darky McFarlane, you know, and we were related through marriage. He married a cousin of mine, you know. And uh, so they would come down and, oh, they'd terrorise us, you know. What are you going across to that rotten mongrel mob? They're no good. And, oh, you know, so this is every night, every <laughs> night. So Saturday morning I walked down to Allen's, get the lift out to Glen Ferry Oval and uh, standing there watching the watching the seconds and all of a sudden old Tommy Layoff comes up to me and Tommy and Normie Goss were like, like brothers, you know, and uh, he comes on. He says, hey, Peter, <laughs> hey, Peter, oh, gosh, he wants to have a word with you. I thought, oh, sh they're still <laughs> shivers, shivers, they're still trying. <laughs> so 
So we, he said, "Round right behind the stand there, you know." So I had to go down and the stand, and there's a there's a the padlocked gate, you know, outside. We bring the machinery up or whatever, and there, there was Normie Goss, uh, Jack Darkey, and and Brenda outside. And I thought I'm going to get another mouthful here. So as I got close, he said, "Listen, forget about what's transpired over the last week." We knew you were going to go at some stage, but we reckon cricket's your game. Cricket's your game you know? So I said, oh, you know, so, uh, you know, all the best. Go out and, and do your best. So that was that was my first game. And I played on Dave Park and, and Dave and I, we laugh about it now and because uh, the second row to Bobby and uh, in the forward pocket, you know, and uh, as good forwards are espoused to do to reward the work done further up the field, as to lead up and try and create play. And anyhow, the ball's coming down, I move forward and, and David grabs me, grabs me by the shorts. And I said, oh, please don't do that, David. <laughs> so it happened on the second occasion, you know. You know, Oh, come on, David, you know. So th- when it came down the third time, uh, a little bit of the old Port Melbourne came out of me and I, uh, I just sat him on his, on his backside, you know. <laughs> And uh, in your first game, first game, first game, first David game. Parkin, David Parkin, <laughs> David, yeah. And uh, we laugh about it now. We, we joke, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, honestly, I, the, the goal umpire had to have seen what was happening, you know. And I, I guess, you know, he thought, oh, well, he might have might have got his right whack top, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, so that was my first game. And we tied the game 126 points apiece. There you the go. first match, 126 points of peace. Yeah. And then you went on and played 178 games for South Melbourne, yeah. another eight for Carlton. Yes. Yeah. As I mentioned before, five-time best and fairest winner at, at South, yeah. three-time goal kicker, uh, as well as playing at times uh, in defence. You played everywhere. Um, and Swans, team of the century, AFL Hall of Fame. And you played for Victoria 13 times. I did. So this is an extraordinary thing about... You know, playing for Victoria 13 times in yeah. Australian football and then playing 39 times for Victoria in cricket. Yeah. And what in what year did you retire? How old were you when you retired? I was probably uh, – I was when I went to Carlton, I, I, I wasn't on my volition. I won't go into it anyhow. It's another story. <laughs> but I, uh, I was 29 when I went there, Adam, and uh, 75 uh, – I was vice captain of Victoria to Jezza, Big Nick was coach, and actually there were five Brownlow medalists in that team. You know, uh, Malcolm Blight, Gary Dempsey, Keith Gregg, Graham Moss, and myself. So in that particular, actually I'll show you later. I've got a little something there, but uh, yeah. So and uh, so that was that was uh, that was a, that was a great memory. So that, so what right. was more special? I mean, five Brownlow medalists, and some of the names you've just mentioned then are icons in Australian football and then you talk about playing cricket with Bill Laurie yeah. and Keith Stackpole and all these sorts of oh, Bobby players. Cow- Bobby Cowper yeah, and I mean, Paul what, Shea and those fellas, you know. So. What, is it, is, can you say what's more special or oh. is it? Yeah, oh, well, they, they probably, they're all perhaps on a par, on a par. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think probably the cricketing thing probably still just holds, holds sway a little a little bit, Adam. Mm. But, unbelievable, mm. unbelievable. So... Did there come a point where you not so much you had to make a decision, but where the two sports were getting a little bit too hard to do both as well as you could, or could oh, you yeah, keep rationalising or justifying that no, they're, they're actually helping each other here. I can I can keep doing the two. Oh yeah, I, I think in a sense one sort of complemented the other, and whilst I, when I was up and about in, in good condition and that I'm. I just sort of took it in my stride. And even in 72-3, uh, so, oh, when Smithy coached South, Smithy was really good because, you know, um, I would go to cricket at the Albert, you know, so Tuesday night in, in February and then train there. And then I'd, same night I'd pop over to South and train for footy. So I trained for both sports on the on the same night, you know. And, uh, yeah, and, and 70, 72-3 was uh, we... The only premiership I played with with the Demons was that particular year and we, we played Collingwood. Collingwood. Collingwood had Norm Emerson, John Berrickree and uh, and Gott, Gotti, Dougie Gott. They were the, they were the quicks. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I batted six and I came in and 
and I remember that crowd around that beautiful setting. There, a lot of people wouldn't even know the Albert Ground existed. They come down Queens Road, yep. St Kilda Road, the palm trees, you know, opposite the old Chevron, and that's you know, just a beautiful setting, isn't it, Adam? You know, Fantastic. And, uh, and the crowd on that day, I came in at four for thirty-seven, and uh, I think I got dropped by Robbie Rose. Robbie putting me down at slip, and Robbie Lamb, who batted three. Uh, he and I put on a, a good partnership. He made 91 and I got a 74. So I think we ended up making about 280 and we knocked Collingwood over for about 180 or something. Yeah, so so that was that was a good memory also. So, so that's a grand final. That was a grand final. March. In March, yeah, March. So, so was there a clash with footy or footy well, used I, to start early April back yeah, then? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd probably go into the footy season playing one practice match. Right. One practice match because Melbourne invariably had pretty good teams because we had a lot of the private school boys and that, you know, yeah. boys up there and that. Not that, you know, that. But, uh, yeah, so, so it was always. But I think Smithy was really good about it, as, as I said earlier. He, you felt that sort of one compliment or the other, I was out doing something and obviously you get some runs, you're, you're building a bit of yeah, fitness, fitness yeah. and that, you know, and uh, so I, I didn't have any problems weight-wise and I, I was always reasonably quick and that's uh, it was just a matter of maybe two or three weeks of training with footy and then you got back into the swing of it again, you know. So. And, and there was no pressure from footy to drop cricket or no. pressure from cricket to drop footy? No, none whatsoever, right. none whatsoever in those days and because – the sports in those days, are, you know, we got a little bit, bit of pay, but they're, they're more or less pastimes almost, you know, really. Uh, probably different now, of course, where I think as, as 15-year-olds have virtually got to determine a pathway, don't they, almost, Adam? They you do. Know? So, uh, but it was nice to be able to, to play, those, play those two sports over that, over that period of time. Yeah, it's really good. Talk to me about knocking back Don Bradman in a roundabout sort of way because well, there was a time where yeah. you almost went to South Australia to play football but yeah. also because Don Bradman thought that you could play cricket for Australia and that South Australia was the place you had to go. Oh, well, I, well, at the end of the, towards the end of the 67 season with Port in the VFA, a fellow called Bob McLean who was secretary of Port Adelaide Footy Club uh, came over and watched a game. And uh, he must have been suitably impressed because he invited Brenda and I over towards the end of the season, you know, to train and, you know, watch a game and that, you know. And Foz Williams was coach of uh, Port Adelaide, wow. Adam, yeah. And, uh, so this is before you played footy for South Melbourne? Before I played with South, yeah, it was 67, I was 20, you know, and uh, third year in Port with Port. So we went over and uh, I remember... Port played uh, South Adelaide at Alberton and Peter Darley, a great South Australian footballer, he was captain and coach of, of, of uh, South Adelaide. And Port were always top of the tree sort mm-hmm. of thing, weren't they? And, and South were middle of the middle of the, the order sort of. And uh, I remember being in the room and Fozzie revved the players up into a frenzy and that and they've, they've run down the race and they're whacking each other and, you know, geeing each other up and anyhow... South won, South beat Port. So we had a had a function, a dinner dance and thing in the in the club rooms at Alberton that night. And I sat opposite a great, you know, Port Adelaide, South Australia winger called um oh, is it surname Light. Uh anyhow, Peter oh, sorry, can't think of his Christian name now. It'll, it'll come to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh Bruce, Bruce Light, Bruce Light. And uh I said, Oh Bruce when's uh when will uh, Foz appear? This is about quarter to nine. And uh, he said, I oh, know you won't see him tonight, Pete. He said, he'll be home stewing over the result. And he said, it'll be Tuesday night at training. He said, it'll be, he'd be like a new penny. So Tuesday night comes. So there he was, up and about. And so we trained that night, then went back to back to, back home. And I got a letter from Bob McLean to the effect saying, you know, are you going to accept the offer? The offer, da 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 come across and... and uh, I had a job lined up with Phil Ridings, who was chairman of Selectors of Australian Cricket, and Sir Donald is in the background inquiring as to whether you're coming. This was in the letter. And uh, we knocked it back at him and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, so why did you knock it back? Oh, well, I just... Well, growing up in Port, you know, Port in those days was like a big country town. You know, everybody knew everybody and he was just sort of... 
and uh, we're just going to get married in the early early um, sixty eight. And so I thought, oh, probably we'll just stay here. And then the, as I say, the opportunity came to go to South, and so things went from there. But uh, so with Sir Donald Bradman just sort of just in the background, identifying you as a as a cricket talent, even though you were potentially going essentially to play football for yeah. Port Adelaide, that yeah. wasn't tempting. You think, gee, if Don, Sir Don Bradman thinks I'm a, a good cricketer, I well, maybe I need to move. Yeah, well, funnily enough, through that summer when the 67, 68, Terry Jenner moved from WA to South Australia and, of course, Terry ended up playing about nine tests for Australia and uh, I, this might sound egotistic but I think if I'd taken that offer, I think I possibly could have, could have played because in that 69, 70 match, Terry Jenner was playing with South Australia and, and Lance Gibb was playing with South Australia and that's when I got the five for 40, you know, I got the, the good figures in that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, but who knows, you know, sort of look back. And, mm. So do you think you were close to playing cricket for Australia? I mean, well, I, were there, I, well, I had a moments? chance. I've got, I was make, uh, making runs and getting wickets and I, actually I've, I've got an article in the scrapbook in that home where and Greg Hobbs has headlined an article. They used to take a second 11 Australian team to New Zealand and Bobby Cowper captained that, and uh, the headline the headline is Bedford can pack bags for New Zealand, and but I I played a match at the MCG, and the last day of the Shield match, it was a bit of a wet day, and I chased the ball out onto the into the outfield and, and slipped on one of the practice wickets because the, the practice wickets used to be on the on the wing sort of thing yep. in those days. So and we had another practice, another match daily on the Friday, so. I declare myself it, and I had a bit of a, you know, bit of a twinge there, and uh, you know, probably probably shouldn't shouldn't have played, but I, I played, and I and I got a couple of low scores, which probably didn't help my cause, but uh, yeah, but Bobby Bitmead ended up going from Victoria, you know, he he went as a as a spinner, left arm, orthodox spinner, yeah, so because you could have gone and played league cricket for Lanc- in the Lancashire League, and oh. then that was going to clash with your footy too, wasn't oh, it? Oh well. It, that's right. In well, well, 1970, uh, Frank Tyson had organised for me to go and play in the Lancashire League with a team called uh, Bake. I think it's pronounced Bake Up, B A C U P, and uh, so we <laughs> we decided to stay and stay and play footy. You know, after well, obviously after I got the uh, you know the opportunity to go and go to South, and uh, I guess without sounding mercenary, going there after playing Shield cricket. And not, you know, getting all that well recompensed. As I say, just getting married, we got this lump sum payment. As I say, which you know was a bit of a deposit on the house. So, so it was just from that viewpoint, it sort of yeah. Anyhow, well, because so, do you look back on it and think, okay, I had an opportunity to go and play Lancashire cricket in 1970. Yep. If you did do that, you wouldn't have won a Brownlow medal. No. And potentially your league football career may never have eventuated it. Do you yeah. see that as a sliding doors moment, or was it always no? Nah, thanks for the offer, but but footy and the and the you know the opportunity, the financial, uh, I guess, inducement to play football was just too much, and it wasn't really a, a consideration. Yeah, probably, probably so. I, I guess if if you know, probably cricket had been uh, cricketers had been more uh, financially remunerated yeah. through that period, it might have been a different a different thing, but. You know, as I say, ultimately just to have that opportunity <laughs> after having to forego the teaching. Is, and as a kid, we all have aspirations when you go up and all I ever wanted to be as a kid was, uh, in whichever order, uh, a teacher and a test cricketer. <laughs> they were my two aspirations as a youngster. And obviously when the teaching opportunity went by the board, you know, I know there was still the opening with a test cricket, but then... You know, there are other considerations, as I say, came along, you know, uh, which sort of uh, put that a little bit yeah. to the back, to the under the back burner a little bit. But yeah, a couple more questions. Yeah. Your your dad, the impact that he had on you, as as you said, he played football for Port Melbourne. Yeah. He played and and a very good footballer. He played cricket for Port Melbourne. Yeah, you followed in his footsteps. Was he your hero, or was your hero more? Um, people that you played with growing up or people that you 
you watched on television or went to the MCG and watched? Oh, yeah. Well, growing up, I, I guess my greatest hero, I, I guess, was my mum. <laughs> my mum was the one who really followed me more so. I think I think Dad, Dad was supportive, but I think he... he uh, linger that disappointment of not getting the opportunity that perhaps that he, he may have had by port not clearing him in those days and, and that, you know. So, but mum would mum was the one who'd really follow me around. She'd come to the cricket and at the Albert and she'd come to the footy and that, you know, more so than dad actually in right, when, okay. I, when, I, when I was up and about, you know. So, mum was, mum was absolutely sensational. And, uh, I guess as a kid, Richie, Richie, I love Richie, Richie Benno. <laughs> love Richie and, and obviously uh, from a footballing aspect, obviously Skilts, Bobby, Bobby yeah. Skilton and growing up in Port Melbourne and and, uh, and quite honestly in those days opposite the, the Graham Station, you know, now if you go through from the city to down to Beacon Cove, the old Port Melbourne Station as it was, they were fully blown stations, Adam. You know, and outside the Graham, the Graham station, there was a, it was a subway, and you'd have two ramps who'd go up to two platforms, and the trains would come through, which were affectionately known as the Red Rattlers. You know, and they would have their carriages, and it might be six or eight carriages on a train, and number ten platform was the Port Melbourne uh, station, and then number eleven was the St Kilda. So. And the Red Rattlers would just leave Flinders Street Station and uh, you come down there. But Bobby and a number of his teammates on a Sunday afternoon, after they'd played on a Saturday, there was a there was a milk bar on the corner called the Graham Gates, you know. Yep. And uh, and that was before you had the overpass on Graham Street. It just used to go straight through. And the gates of the Graham Street Station were just those big wooden gates and you used to have a... A, a chap up in the hut there, and he would he would operate the gates when the trains would come come through and that you know. So, but there was a big rockery area just to the side around the side there of the of the train line, and Bobby and his couple of teammates would come on a Sunday afternoon, and they'd have a kick with we kids, the kids and that there, and, you know. So it was just sort of a bit a bit surreal having you know Amazing. Bobby Bobby Skilton coming yeah, there just right. to have, a, and that really sort of reinforced your love of love of the game and. I guess uh, support of of, uh, of South and that, yeah. So, yeah. did your leggies come as a result of Richie Benno, or was it something that you could always? It was just something do? I I enjoyed in the street. We'd be in the, through the summer in I grew up in in Farrell Street in Port Melbourne, just behind uh, old Jack Jack Woodruff's there at the dairy there. And Jack was fantastic to me when I had to leave uh, Turok Teachers College. Jack employed me for a couple of years up in the office doing the farmer's accounts and that, you know. And it was really good, Adam, because Jack, they used to have this Wednesday afternoon competition, you know, and it would be uh, Jack's team of the Woodruff Dairies, the dairies, <laughs> and you'd have the police, the coppers, you'd have the fire brigade, you'd have a lot of the utilities that have, have teams on Wednesday afternoon, you know, and uh, what was the one the Carlton boys used to remember, the, a few of the Carlton boys, Ian Botham came and played, I think, with the, um, I just eludes me, yeah, the name of the team, yeah, yeah anyhow, but... But they'd have six or six or eight teams and that, and we used to play at, at uh, Royal Park, and those tables at Royal Park, and they were pristine. And then rationalisation came in, and uh, I think you'd have one curator trying to look after the three overs, and they, and they, um, yeah, they fell apart a bit. Uh, but yeah, but Jack's Wednesday afternoon, you'd get Wednesday afternoon off and go and play cricket, <laughs> and, and invariably, each of the teams would co-opt one or two district players, yep. you know, Premier players to play. So it was really, really good good practice in that in, in those yeah. particular those particular days, you know. So who was the best cricketer you played with, do you think, with all your time with Victoria? Oh, gee whiz. Or is there one that had the biggest impact on you, not only in your cricket career but even maybe your life, that that was a, a bit of a mentor or an idol? Oh, jeez. It's putting you under pressure here. Probably, probably hard to dis- yeah, hard to distinguish. But probably, you know, as I say, growing up as a kid, Freddie Layla at Port was one who really sort of, you know, uh, gave me plenty of encouragement and and and, uh, and support in those in those early early days. But generally speaking, in the um, 
when when you played when you played state cricket, you know, you, there was a group of us who were probably in our early twenties. Then you had the likes of Fando, Stacky, Redders, and that who were close around the thirty mark. So, is that a pinch you, pinch yeah. me sort of moment? Redpath, Stackpole, Laurie. Oh yeah, and you're playing with them exactly as he said you were going to the MCG and watching them play and then all of a sudden you're playing with them. What, what was that like? Oh, no, exactly, exactly. You know, you, you, in your wildest dreams, you, you know, you, as you say, you had to, had to pinch yourself almost to, to think you, you're playing in the same company as, uh, as those, those great players. Were they accepting of the younger players coming through? Were they encouraging or were they, they were the, they were the, oh, the, no, the, big, no, the big we, men on I, campus? I think it was really good because I think it was a nice uh, balance between the young ones and the older ones and, uh, yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was a great atmosphere really, you know, playing, playing uh, you know, along, alongside those particular players. Yeah. I've asked everyone that we've come in for a, a chat about what Victorian cricket means to them. So from your point of view, having played football for Victoria as well as Cricket Victoria for Victoria. What what does it mean when you look back to think of that you've worn the the navy blue cap of Victoria? Oh well, as I said, as a youngster, all I ever wanted to to do was to play Test cricket and and, and uh, be a teacher. And but to have even got to the stage where I was able to play, as you say, just on those forty matches for Victoria is something which for me is just uh, as you get older. So you look back on it and. and the memories are so sustainable with the the players you played with and the the, the different memories of uh, incidences and uh, the good fortune of being able to be part of, of two winning Sheffield Shield teams and that and uh, it's just uh, just one of those things that I, I guess um, a young a young kid you know just with a passion for cricket could ever dream of uh, Adam and it's just uh, it's just great to watch watch. The young ones developing and going about their skills at the at the moment, and that, and just uh, as I say, just wishing everybody uh, to do as well as they possibly can, and and get the big spec up, you know, up there as a as a powerhouse in uh, Sheffield Shield cricket, and that again, yeah. So you're still involved in cricket, which is remarkable for someone that is seventy six years of age. You're actually I, coaching. I, yeah, I play, but I, yeah, <laughs> but I, I play mainly with the. Um, Still doing a bit with Swan Richards yeah. and a lot of the others that know Swan with the Crusaders and that. And uh, actually, I played a match on December the eleventh uh, at uh, at um, Melbourne Grammar. You know, we uh, and uh, it was actually a, a dank old morning, a drizzly rain, and I was expecting a call from Swan to mm-hmm. say, "Oh, you know, the game, the game's been cancelled." But uh, fortunately, we were able to get a game. It was truncated from forty to thirty-five, but we we had a full day, and it was a terrific day at. Uh, at Melbourne Grammar, so the body's holding up all right, Adam. And uh, you know, I um, I still roll out a few overs of leggies at times, but on occasions, you know, with, with the Crusaders teams, the, the the boys have given their day up, and that. So I um, I try and make sure everybody gets an opportunity. So usually, say with the forty overs, the two openers will go in, and uh, at the start of it, I say nobody's going to make a hundred today. You know. Even though Swan, I guess, in a sense, might like some of them there. And I like us to get around about 40 overs, so you make 220, 200. So I think Swanee would like to see us get about 250, <laughs> 260. But, uh, but I, I like to, don't like to get it uh, out of the reach of the boys, maybe, you know, where maybe 260 is a bit of, a bit of an ask for a school. But, you, but some of the schools obviously have, have great young kids and that who are playing. Cricket at a at a high level outside of school and that too as well. So, but yeah, the openers will go in and the, my bat for ten or twelve overs get a thirty and I'll just drag them in and send another two out and you know, and then when it comes to bowl bowling, give the, the fellas a good opportunity to have a good good bowl bowl their six seven overs or whatever you know as long as just to try and give give them mm. an opportunity to get something out of the day and that you go away feeling good about themselves. <laughs> so with the young kids that are coming through now, whether it be through you're coaching at Donvale and you've coached a lot of cricket for a long time, um, but also through the Crusaders, you're seeing the, the next generation of players coming through. Do they – is cricket still – cricket's different now than what it was when you were growing up, but is it still fundamentally the same? Do you still see the same 
sort of talent in, in kids? Oh, I think so, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's still there. It's just, of course, we're all individuals and some of them approach it a bit differently. You've got to try and perhaps push, push them a little bit to go because some of them think it's going to come too easily. So it's one of those, one of those games, obviously, where you just got to keep encouraging and try to get them to... Uh, and as I say, as, as a youngster, all I ever did, I'd be in the street when I was... <coughs> pardon me. When I wasn't playing, I would be on a pole. I know it's, it's a different world now with, mm. you know, the, the number of vehicles and that on the road and where you don't, you don't get the kids. But we, we would play matches against other streets and that where you'd, you'd have the fruit boxes as uh, wickets and that, you know. But I'm, su- I'm sure a lot of that still goes, goes on in... Uh, in different suburbs and that, but I'm sure the passion's still there, you know, and um, there's so much cricket now on free to wear and that week people get a chance, youngsters get a chance to, to watch it and uh, and I think just watching play, that, as I said, as a youngster I'd be at the MCG in, through the summer, you know, watching three or four Sheffield, Sheffield matches and I think that's where you sort of learn to, to develop or some of your skills by just watching watching mm. players, seeing how they go yep. about it. And, and I think, as again, as I said, my first season uh, in 66-7, I was 12th man for the majority of the season. So I got to sit there and, and watch a lot of stuff happening. And, and I think it helped me immensely as I moved forward with my career, just seeing how, how players went about, you know, um, went about their game. And that, you know, so, so was it more watching or were you brave enough to ask questions and – be a bit of a sponge for information. Oh, no, you'd ask questions, you'd ask questions and that. Yeah, 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 you'd ask questions. It's, uh, whichever whichever way you could sort of, you know, improve your own your own game. Yeah. Why, why, because why, I don't know the answer to this, mm. if I ask myself this question, why do you love cricket so much? What What is it about it that you love? For someone, that, as I said, that still now is playing sometimes multiple times a week. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what is it about it? Oh, it's just I, I love the challenge. I love the challenge, and I'm, I'll just go back to a little a little story. I yeah. remember playing a game with Port Seconds, and on the straight, it's not all that long, you know, more than behind the, the Lansbury there, and uh, I was bowling from the Babian end, and this oh, very solid fellow threw one up, and he's bang straight back over my head, six bang. Straight back, I mean, three consecutive sixes. And I thought, oh, I just threw one up a little bit wider. So he went again, top-edged it, you know, to cover. And I said, oh, please, dear God, please let him catch it, which he did. So I thought, one for 18 from four, that's that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> so, but I think it's, it's that sort of thing where, uh, you know, there's always a challenge with each particular ball you face, you know, and that and... Uh, it's a game of problem solving, isn't it? It really? is. It is. It is. You know, you no balls the same, and you've got to just, you know, batting, bowling, and whatever. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. No, it's, it was. Yeah. No, that that's one of the exciting parts about the exciting part about our game. Yeah, which, I agree. Which you love. Yeah. Do you still watch Victoria play now when they're I do. in action? I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you um, like about? What you see these days, or particularly from a Victorian point of view? Oh well, I think you know, sort of just the you see the development of some of the younger ones coming through, and actually some of the uh, some of the ones who are coming into the into the Shield team. You know, um, I must admit, I have to sort of go back through the, and have a look where they actually where they're actually playing their Premier cricket and that. You know, but but uh, yeah, you know, some of them are coming along coming along nicely, and and, and I guess with the the current stop of crop of, uh, of Australian uh, batters and bowlers, you know, there's going to be opportunities mm. uh, coming coming forth pretty soon, I think, as, as our, our Australian team is ageing, isn't it? You know? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So I've got to ask you before we yeah. finish up, your nickname, Wheels. Yes. Now, you're either known as Wheels or you're known as... The Brownlow medalist Peter Bedford. It's, it's one of the two. Yeah, it's usually not, wheels. Yeah, it's not triple Brownlow medalist Bobby Skilton. No, it's not triple <laughs> Brownlow medalist Bobby. But Bobby Skilton never played cricket for Victoria. No, he played. He actually played district cricket with Melbourne. Oh, did he really? He played first eleven with Melbourne. I did not know that. Yeah. Where did it come from? Wheels. Wheels. Well, when 
you first make the Sheffield Shield team representing Victoria, everybody, it's mandatory you've got to have a nickname, Adam. And uh, as I say, you go around to each of the, the players there and what do you think, Adam? What do you think, Dylan? You know, so <laughs> everybody contributes. And uh, at the end of it, you, you hit on it, you know, after about half a day, you know, you, you know, you've, it's <laughs> in your memory and the way you're going. You know. But mine was arrived at very simplistically. People, people say to me how you know, ask you the same question and they say, oh, Bedford, how is your name derived? How is your nickname derived? Because when you play, because I, oh, that being it, I, I kick both feet and I work both sides of my body and that when I play, <clears throat> in those days back, which generally, well, the likes of Skelton and that do it, but generally speaking, speaking, most players were pretty much just one-sided type of thing. But anyhow, and people say, was it the way you play? And I said, oh, no, unfortunately, I said, it's because of my surname, Bedford Trucks. Ah, Trucks run on wheels. Yes. <laughs> so that's how it evolved. Right, there you go. Bedford trucks, trucks on wheels. Must have been the speed between the wickets yeah, or yeah, the, all that I sort might, of thing. I might use that, I think. I might, <laughs> I might yeah, put the sweep the other one under the carpet and, and use that one, Adam. You know, so. Well, thank you so much no. for coming in and chatting yeah. to us. As I said, we've wanted to do this for... For quite some time. Yeah. You are an icon in Victorian cricket history. I've been, I've been very blessed, Adam. Yeah, so I've been very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. but to have the, the the amazing story of being able to play cricket for Victoria while being a Brownlow medalist is just, it blows people's minds. And, yeah. and I know it was a different era, but it still yeah. shows how, how talented you were as a sportsman here in Melbourne. And to be able to do what you've been able to do is quite remarkable. And the fact you're still active in the cricket community, I think, yeah. is particularly special for someone with your, with your uh, I guess, your resume. So um, thank you for coming in and um, we really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Adam. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, really enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Peter Bedford, Victorian cricketer, Brownlow medalist, five-time South Melbourne Best and Fairest winner, Swans Team of the Century, AFL Hall of Fame, Victorian representative, Crusader. He's done it all and he's joined us today on the Vic State Cricket Podcast.